we welcome in our next guest, another uh, attorney in the wings, Joe Ferretti from the Mansion Ferretti Law Firm. Good morning, Torts. How are you, sir? Uh, doing well. Good morning, fellas. And, uh, you know, I, I, Rob, I glanced at your schedule this morning, and I see that you slotted me in between Joe Manchin and Mike Height, two heavy hitters. So I <laughs> want to thank you for that, that <laughs> slotting. <laughs> hey, if there's anybody I don't mind slotting, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the segment where everybody goes to get a cup of coffee or check on their pets, I, I, I fear. But <laughs> or get coffee for your pets. Who knows? If cocaine bear can be a hit, maybe coffee cat can also be a hit. I don't know. Yeah, what what is the deal with that? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I keep hearing so much about this movie, and yeah. I, I, I get the sense it's going to be uh, like the Hangover movie. You know, it's just kind of campy and fun, but uh, uh, it just seems like it's getting a lot of publicity right now. <laughs> it, it got good reviews. It, 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 is, it is apparently funny and gory at the same time because there are some people who get mauled. Have I not read it's based oh. on a true story? It is. So, but I, I don't ever remember hearing the true story. Well, it's, so. you know. I have to go look that up. History you know? is written it's... by history is written by the winners, and that bear probably OD and died. So he, could, he couldn't write a very good story. He couldn't hibernate, <laughs> not for a long time. Uh, uh, Joey, we uh, invited you on the program today to talk about deliberate intent, and uh, as uh, Matt Harvey pointed out uh, in his best Jack Nicholson. Is there any other kind? You know that uh, voice there. Uh, yeah, really. So, so let's talk about deliberate intent uh, first and foremost. We should have asked Mike Height this question, but uh, is it going to become law in West Virginia as this bill moved through the House and Senate? Well, it, it's out of the House uh, on a closer vote than anticipated. I think it was fifty-two forty-five. Yes, to get the to get the bill out of the House, and, and recall that there's an eighty-eight twelve majority in the house of the republicans and and this has been on the republican hit list for years so uh the 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 margin of the vote would indicate that it's not a done deal coming out of the senate but i think it will eventually pass out of the senate also and once it gets to the governor's desk it will be signed into law okay so let's backtrack then and tell us what deliberate this deliberate intent law is meant to fix and what the issue was that needed fixed well, let's recall, this all centers around the workers' compensation system in the state of West Virginia, and everybody understands, I'm sure, how that works. If you're injured on the job, and let me stress it's for accidental injury on the job, then typically you have a workers' compensation claim to file where you receive medical coverage for any medical bills related to injuries suffered on the job, and you also receive what's called indemnity payments, which is to replace your income, not completely, but at the rate of uh, 60 percent. So while you're injured on the job and, and say you're off the job getting medical treatment, workers' compensation is the system designed to get you well, get you back on the job, or in the case of more serious injuries, provide what's called either a temporary total or permanent partial award in addition to your medical coverage and indemnity payments for your injury. So if you have a permanent injury, let's say you you lost a couple digits on on one hand, uh, you would be rated by an orthopedist as to what extent uh, that's a permanent injury, what impairment you are suffering from as a result of that injury. And workers' compensation then would make an additional award to you for that uh, permanent injury. That's the system we're all familiar with. Uh, In addition to that, uh, workers who are injured on the job due to the deliberate indifference of their employer to known safety risks or hazards on the job also have the option of filing an additional claim against their employer. We refer to it as deliberate intent. But really what it involves is the requirement that you show or have proof that your employer had a knowledge, had a realization of a safety concern. Maybe the other workers brought it to the attention of the employer. Uh, Maybe it's a violation uh, of OSHA regulations, something of the sort that the employer knows 
is something that should be addressed or corrected on the job. The employer chooses not to do anything about it. The worker then suffers a serious injury as a result. That worker under current law in West Virginia and in most states in this country can file an additional claim to the workers' compensation benefits seeking compensation under the deliberate intent statute. And that's what has been really the focus of the legislature going back now to 2014. Uh, the re- laws were reformed in 2015 in terms of deliberate intent and the requirements of proof that the employee has to meet to have such a claim. And now reforms are being kicked around again to cap damages that are available under the law. And so that's what we're talking about. It's the conscious disregard of safety by the employer. The employee can then bring a case. They have to prove their case, unlike workers' comp, which is basically a no-fault system. The employer, employee does not have to prove negligence or anything of the sort. In a deliberate intent case, the burden of proof is on the employee to establish those factors that led directly to the injury suffered. When we, I can't remember which delegate it was we spoke with last week or the week before regarding this bill. They said the cap was raised from 250000 to $500,000. Somebody in our audience commented that was misleading because previously there had been no cap. Uh, that's correct. Uh, the current law is there's no cap on the non-economic damages in the case. Now, the the $250,000 cap that was initially proposed in the House, it it was, uh, in my opinion, egregious. Uh, If you can imagine the 29 miners who died in the Sago mine disaster, uh, if those 29 families had cause to bring a deliberate intent case, in addition to the workers' compensation settlements they all received, uh, the way the law was constructed, those 29 families would be splitting $250,000. It was a per-occurrence cap, meaning that if all 29 miners died due to one occurrence, and we know it was due to the accumulation of gases in the mine, those 29 families would have been dividing up $250,000. Uh, and, and as a result, I think most people would agree we, we cannot stand. So... Uh, the changes in the House were to raise the cap to $500,000 and to make it a per-claim versus per-occurrence cap, meaning that each claimant would have the ability to receive compensation up to the sum of $500,000 in non-economic damages. Okay, that's, that's in addition to whatever other medical bills they might have in the future if it's a long-lasting permanent injury. Or if in the case of death, it would be uh, an award for the loss of, uh, of lifetime of income that that individual would have earned. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Joe. Um, so, Good morning, Matt. So this is what's commonly referred to as it just caps punitives at 500000 Well, it, it, it's, it's more than punitives, Matt. It, it's okay. non-economic losses. So for, for the, let's say for the miner, uh, the logger, somebody who works in a factory that has a permanent injury where they become totally disabled and unable to work again, there would be the economic losses, okay, uh, of, that they would have from not having lifetime earnings, but there would also be the non-economic losses, okay, the, the strain on the family. The, uh, the, the worry, the anxiety of not having an income for the rest of their life, the inability to work and be productive. We know that the individuals, many of us, find our uh, much of our worth through the work we do. And if, if you're sitting at home not able to, to get out there and, and hustle and, and work for your family, we know the, the serious emotional problems that can cause somebody. And, and also the pain and suffering that your family members also suffer along with you, and and that's what's capped now at five hundred thousand dollars. That's a good distinction. Thank you. Um, so, when I was reading about this, Allegheny Woods seems to be uh, one of the the 
businesses that's out there in the forefront and they're citing that their insurance rates to operate are going up and it's making it really hard for them to stay in business do you have any insight into um if it's that particular industry because they're in the the in the timber industry or if it's other industries as well Uh, i'll tell you that the impetus for the reforms this year in this legislation session is with the log and timber industry. And I can understand where they're coming from with respect to the cost of insurance because in addition to workers' compensation premiums that the employer has to pay, they also take out a policy. It's a broad form policy, if you will, under insurance terms where they can add additional coverage for these deliberate intent claims. Now, the problem I have, Matt, with the log and timber industry is that, and if you look at the numbers, it's, it's, it's quite telling. There's about 850 log and timber companies registered to do business in the state of West Virginia. Roughly a third of them subscribe to the workers' compensation system in the state. Two-thirds shirk their responsibility to have workers' compensation coverage for their employees. So what happens is the risk pool that is formed with these with that particular industry is small, artificially small. So those who follow the law and actually provide workers' compensation coverage, they're paying a high premium because the risk pool is so small because many of their brothers and sisters in the industry don't subscribe to workers' comp. So what they're telling you is true in a sense. Yeah, their premiums are high, but it's because many of them don't subscribe to workers' compensation. And it's like any other issue with insurance. We know that the the whole idea is to broaden the risk by having many participants in the pool, the risk pool, so that uh, no one individual company or entity is paying a large sum. It's spreading the risk. That's all the whole concept of insurance. But when you have so many in that industry who just flat out refuse to subscribe to workers' comp, those who do, do pay a high premium. Is that unique to that industry? I would say it is because the loggers and timbering companies, uh, a lot of them are small outfits, and they're able to utilize an arcane law in West Virginia that if you have five or less employees, you don't have to subscribe to workers' compensation. So what they'll do is, you know, they may have an owner and four loggers, and what the logging company owner will do is list all four of those employees as owners, meaning there are no employees, and, such, and as such, they don't have to subscribe to workers' compensation. So they, they, some of them utilize that law to get around it. Others are just scoff laws, and regardless of what state law says, they don't subscribe. Now, they give up their protections under the law when that happens and there's a serious injury on the job, the workers' compensation bar doesn't save them because there is no workers' compensation coverage with that company. But it, it, in the back end of it, in terms of the, the premiums that these companies pay, it's artificially high because of that non-participation. Matt Miller. Joe, is that a potential lawsuit in and of itself for an injured worker of one of these companies that is not paying into the workers' compensation system like they are supposed to? So now I get injured as one of their employees. I have no compensation coming because they're not part of the system. Could I not then file a suit? Hey, why weren't you guys a part of this? Indeed, Matt. Uh, And that's the risk that these companies who don't have workers' compensation coverage take. Remember that workers' compensation is to be uh, almost an exclusive remedy for an injury suffered on the job. The employee does not have to prove negligence. Only with egregious conduct by the employer and egregious injuries suffered by the employee can they proceed with an additional claim under the deliberate intent statute. But with an employer who does not have any workers' compensation coverage, the employee is free to sue. And there's no workers' compensation bar. There's no statutory requirement approving a deliberate intent case. The employer is out there naked and can be sued uh, under almost all circumstances regarding a workplace injury for more than the workers' compensation system would actually compensate that 
injured employee for under the current uh, statutory scheme. So, yeah, you take a risk when you don't have workers' compensation coverage, but many of these logging companies have assumed the risk and have obviously determined that it's in their best interest to take that risk rather than uh, pay the premiums to workers' compensation. And it's a shame because it creates this situation that we're in now where those companies that do comply pay a higher premium. Again, as far as an employee, again, let's say I'm working for that logging company. They do have workers' comp. Uh, You mentioned earlier, and I want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly, I then, as the injured person, look at the situation and have to then prove that, you know, hey, this is something that they should have been dealing with. We had complained about this particular type of harness or whatever it may be. They did not make the effort as a company to fix this situation. I then have been injured as a result of that now i'm ready to potentially file an additional claim that's right and let me give you a a quick example of the kind of claim we're talking about and this was actually testimony i think in the house committee on the issue of deliberate intent before they voted And and by the way ironically the house voted a day after having a moment of silence for a minor who was killed in the southern coal fields so a little irony there, but yeah, and, and perhaps say, yeah. one of the reasons maybe why the vote was so close. But uh, a, a lady working in a veneer factory uh, worked on a, a rolling lathe, which uh, any woodworker knows it, it, it planes the wood down to uh, what is a finer finish. Um, and for a long time, the employees, particularly the lady and others who worked on that lathe, complained about the lack of a an employee guard, you know, a guard there that, that you where you couldn't get your hand caught or your hair caught or something in the, in the rollers. Well, the, the company then suffered a fire around that same uh, lathe, and it ruined the electronic stop, emergency stop system on the lathe. The red button that the employee can push in an emergency to stop all operations if uh, somebody gets caught in the rollers. That system was damaged in a fire. Rather than replace the, the, the emergency stop system and it, r- rather than put an employee guard in place to protect the employee working around those rollers, the employer chose to do nothing. And this, this lady gets her hair caught in the rollers and she gets literally scalped. And, and, and pardon the description here, but it, it's worth telling Uh, She loses her hair. She loses her scalp all the way down to her ears are pulled completely off her head. And she filed a deliberate intent case arguing that not only did the employer know that these safety systems were inoperable or not in place, but they were cited by OSHA on at least two occasions prior to her injury. That's deliberate indifference. That's deliberate intent. And that lady successfully pursued a claim against her employer. And that's the whole public policy behind the law. It's to incentivize employers to have safeguards in place for the safety of their employees in areas where it's either regulated by OSHA or it's a well-known safety standard in the industry. Uh, Employers should be following those those, uh, dictates and we would hope the law would encourage them to do so rather than them face the risk of further liability. So in that particular case, it was up to the judge and or whomever was making that decision for that claim as to how much that this lady would receive in the non-economic um, award, correct? Ind- indeed. Um, those cases are always first screened by the judge to make sure that the The person pursuing the case has made the statutory, um, has offered the statutory proof to support the claim. So there's always a vetting by the judge to make sure you've met the threshold to have a deliberate intent case. Once you survive that legal challenge, then the issue's uh, in front of a uh, judge and jury, and the jury ultimately makes the award of damages. The reforms that are now being talked about are to constrain the jury's that when they have these cases, 
award no more than $500,000 in non-economic damages or two times the economic losses, whichever is greater. That's what's been now struck in the legislature as proposed legislation, and I think ultimately that's what's going to pass. So the reforms are really looking at the jury system now and, and, and dictating to the jury, okay, you can find an award, you can compensate these injured parties, but you have these constraints now, and uh, you have to stay within those constraints. And, and, Joe, whatever that award is, nobody works for free. I presume you have to get an attorney, and the attorney also is going to take a cut of that as compensation for the time spent representing you in court, correct? That, that is correct. And and the attorney's fees will you know be your standard attorney's fees, probably a third, 35%, maybe even up to 40% if you're going to trial. And it's because the lawyers know with the reforms that have been instituted going back to 2015, these cases are much harder to win. Uh, and much harder to pursue economically now because of these damage caps that are going to be imposed on the back end. Uh, you know, lawyers are no different than anybody else. If we find that economically the cases are, are not viable for us to handle, we're not going to do them. So uh, I can tell you statistically since 2015, the number of filings of deliberate intent cases in West Virginia has dropped 75%. And that's because everybody's being much safer in the workplace, correct? <laughs> well, as I indicated, we just had a minor death here a couple, uh, a few days ago. Um, I, look, West Virginia, uh, this law has always been important in West Virginia because we know we have industry in this state that it, it has inherent dangers in it. Uh, the logging industry, the mining industry, the steel industry. I, I worked in a steel mill. I, I know that uh, every day you walked in there, you know, something awful could really happen. And, and, and if you rely on your employer to make it as safe as possible for you to follow safety regulations and safety standards. And when they fail to do that, you know, there should be a price to pay. That, that's always been my philosophy. And, and I, I've always adhered to the philosophy that ultimately juries should decide what that, that price is. I've never been a fan of damage caps. I think it's artificial, I think it's arbitrary, and I think it's uh, uh, really contrary to Seventh Amendment rights under the Constitution. Joe, thanks so much for your time this morning. We will uh, we'll talk to you again Friday morning, eh? Okay. Okay, guys. Thank Have you kindly. Morning.